maybe. But I actually I'm really optimistic about it. Now, in a similar way, you guys are now approaching three tough weeks. And while I'm out there running like buggery every morning, you're going to be programming like buggery. Can we swap? <laughs> Can we swap? <laughs> Um, I was so thinking it'd be good if like, you know this Wii thing where you can just, you don't need a mouse or anything, you've got this, I'm just thinking this got to be the way of the future. I mean, the whole idea of a mouse and needing a table is really bizarre, isn't it? And, and I've got to say, in the old days people had keyboards and they thought mice were bizarre, and now we have another pointing device that's more f flexible than a keyboard, and, uh, and now we think mice are it, but this Wii thing, I think it's the way of the future. I can just imagine, in the future I'll be able to go for a jog and I'll be able to program like that. I'll be able to, ha, ha, hoo, ha, ha, ha. And then, because that's so much more expressive than, you know, moving fingers and pushing little buttons. That's, if you think about it, quite a bizarre thing to do, given the amount of flexibility I have with my whole body. You know, there's got to be some other way of typing that doesn't involve pushing fingers into predefined spots. So, I'm expecting, yeah, in the future you'll be able to jog and do your assignment at the same time. How awesome! Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is, at the start of the lecture, at this time when you're most receptive and you're listening most clearly to everything I've got to say, shh, 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 except you, <laughs> shh, 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 shh. Um, I want you to, uh, I want it to sink in that we're now approaching three tough weeks, and you're going to have to work really hard for three weeks. Now, task two finished uh, last week, last Thursday. And I've spent the weekend looking through everyone's diary, or everyone's diary that I can. And it's interesting, in task one, I noticed a big difference in the diary. Half the people could already program and found it all straightforward, though they were grappling with style. And half the people had never programmed before, and they found the actual act of programming really difficult. And if I had to divide the happy, relaxed diaries from the slightly stressed diaries, it would be if you could already program, your diary was more happy. And if you couldn't program, your diaries were more stressed. Well, this time, as I was reading through the diaries, again, they divided quite clearly into two lines. People that were happy and people that were stressed. But this time, it seemed to have nothing to do with your programming ability. And there were people who could program who were stressed, and people who are type um, A's who just started programming and were really happy. And in fact, the breakdown was, can anyone guess? It was just so bizarrely clear. <laughs> Understanding the spec? Understanding the spec? Y yes, but that was sort of a consequence. Start date. Start date. When I opened a diary, I glanced at the top of the diary, and I saw the date. And if the, often there was a thing saying, spec came out today, we'll think about it later. And if you ignore that entry, if the first entry was like 26, 27, or 28, I thought, shoo. Oh, these guys are in trouble. And then it was a stress diary from then on about how I didn't understand what was going on, how freaking out, how vowed would never do this again. Ah, and if they were a competent programmer, they were cursing at the spec and saying, why wasn't it done this way instead of that way? And I could write it myself better. And they were just angry and stressed. And if they started, came out today, we'll try this. Next day, tried that. Next day, tried that. It was a really pleasant experience reading all the way through. And they had all these aha moments where they go, oh, I see, and of course, and da-da-da. Now, not everyone that started early finished. Some people that were new programmers still didn't finish, even though they started early. And not everyone that started late had problems. A lot of people that started late did finish. But it was really striking, the levels of stress. Now, as you go through your life, you want to have a happy life. You don't want to be like the people reading, writing these stress diaries. That is, that's a way to get a heart attack. So. For that relatively easy task, task two, it generated a lot of stress in some people because I think you forgot what I said in the first lecture, which is the day the assignment comes out, that's the day you start. And if you miss two days before you start, you're in deep trouble. And remember I said I videoed everyone at the end of the course and I said, guys, you can pass one message on in a time capsule. This is like a time machine going in the easy direction to the next generation doing this course. What's the one message? And what did everyone shout out? Start your assignments early. That was our one piece of advice after doing the whole course. Nothing about using malloc or abstraction or don't forget. Nothing about that. Their one tip to you guys was start your assignments early. So the project comes out today. I have noticed amongst computing people, all right, let's be honest, I've noticed looking at myself that I can program and I'm hopeless with time management. And luckily I'm not alone in this. I'd say at least half of you, well, from the evidence, at least half, certainly, are also equally 
weak on time management. And maybe you've got away with it in the past because you've known more or you've been faster or smarter or the teachers haven't cared. There have been all these compensating things you've been able to do. But that's been working against you, but you've been able to compensate. It's like writing messy maths. You can be a good mathematician even though you write messy maths. If the work's really easy and you're just way ahead of everyone, it doesn't matter if your stuff's all messy because you can compensate in lots of ways. But as you go on to do more and more advanced maths, if your working is actually messy, you're dead. You, know, you just can't do the really hard math because your working's just holding you back. And it's bizarre because neatness, you wouldn't think, had anything to do with maths at all. Well, it's exactly the same with time management. So to help you guys time manage the big project, so we don't see any diary entries that say, oh, a week to go on the three-week project, I better start now. <laughs> Because that, that would just completely, it just it actually gives me a heart attack. Don't do that. We've, we've divided the project into three phases. Now, we've, we've named them somewhat incorrectly. Phase one, phase two, and phase three. We should have started with phase zero. I'm very sorry. In a sense, there is a phase zero, and I'll tell you what that is. Each of these last exactly one week, for, or roughly one week. Uh, some of them are due on a Sunday, some on a Monday. Each of them has something to hand in. Most of the work and the hardest part is the first two phases. The last phase is actually the easiest phase because by then I figure lots of your other assignments are going to start falling due and I don't want to be competing with them and I want you to be happy. Of these two that are the hardest, probably the harder of the two is phase one. You have coming out today a project. Due in on Sunday is phase one, the hardest part of the project. You have between now and Sunday to do it. If you take a day off and relax and go out and look at the birds and smile, you're freaking me out. <laughs> OK, so I don't want you to lose this. You've got to keep the momentum up now. I'll be running like a maniac. I'll be sweating. I'll be working hard over these three weeks. You've got to be doing it too. So just as I like an electrical shock to your body, do not come out of this lecture and think, oh, I'll look at the spec tomorrow. And then when you look at the spec, think, oh, that's confusing. I'll think about it tonight, and I'll start it on Wednesday. And on Wednesday, think, oh, I'll fool around a bit. That's not making sense. Gee, I better revise a bit. Don't do that! Because if you do, I mean, write that in the diary by all means as a sort of amusing, cruel revenge on me. But don't actually do it, because I'll be reading your diary in the background, and so will your tutor. And we'll be up, 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 jumping up and down on the spot. So, all right, everyone got it? Phase one, phase two, phase three. Now, let me talk a little bit about. Um, uh, I'm looking for an eraser. Uh -huh. Let me talk about task two. I'll have some light. So when, when should we start? When should we start phase one? Now. 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 Let's not talk about task two. Let's just start it. Now. That is cool thinking. Ta I'm only going to talk about task two because diabolically it's going to help you with task, the project. In fact, that's the whole reason we have task two. Task two is normally just there. Uh, I, I like doing it so you have predigested some of the idea, ideas you're going to need for the project. So, because as you know, task two was hard. Task two was hard not because the coding was hard. Why was task two hard? Unit Time management, unit testing. The, yeah, like the, the concepts in task two were hard. There are a whole lot of new concepts that might have annoyed you or got in the way or frustrated you or took a long time to work out what the heck we were trying to do. Nonetheless, you've hopefully now all understood them and know what we want. And, and the project follows that very, very closely. All right, so task two, first of all, let me say, well done. Because I've seen um, some excellent task two submissions. And I'm reading through the diaries. I've seen a lot of people haven't given up, that have been stuck with problems and have persevered and have solved the problems. And have worked really hard at it. So I get the sense that you know, nearly every single person in the course worked hard on this task and managed to pull things off. So that was really cool. So well done. I was really pleased with task two. A little side note. What if you found it hard? 
Let's just talk about that. Now, you will have found it hard because it's got all these crazy ideas and had unit testing in it and had lots of multiple files you had to compile and things were broken up in weird ways. Why isn't it all just together? You know, all that would have been hard. But if you found it hard just because you couldn't quite get your C to work because you're having problems with arrays or C syntax and just your very, very basic programming wasn't working, it wasn't hard because of the ideas, it was just hard because of the Cs, then this is a good time to pause and think because the programming shouldn't have been too hard. Now, if you found it a bit hard, but you're able to persevere and solve it, that was fine. But if you weren't able to solve it, so if you couldn't actually get the programming part of it to work, then you should think very carefully, because this is the last week you can transfer to 1911. And you should seriously think about doing that if you think your programming hasn't made it. So now here's your test. Speak to your tutor. Your tutor knows you intimately, and we've been talking about you, some students on, via email and occasionally on the forum. So I, I know that the tutors are worried about some of you, one or two. So do talk with your tutors and ask them what they think. They're wise, and they will have good suggestions for you. If you didn't finish it because you started late, or you had programming problems because you started late and you were stressed, I can't really offer you any sensible advice because I don't know what the problem was. Was it that you were stressed and you couldn't program, or was it because you just haven't got on top of the programming yet, I can't tell. But if you started early, strove the whole way through it, and still couldn't work the programming out, I mean, you will have got a few little, you know, no one's gonna get it perfect, but really if you're thinking, I'm floundering, I don't understand what the heck, I don't understand how to write the program, it's all right if you don't understand what to do, because the what to do was hard on this, but if you're thinking you can't actually write the code, ah, uh, well then, think about it. Because you can transfer to 1911, in their whole course, they do, no more than we've already done, or we, we, we've passed them a couple of weeks ago. So if you went there, it'd be this easy ride because they've done, you've done everything that they've done, probably. I mean, there'll be it's odds and sods that we didn't exactly synchronize on. You'll be able to take all your marks across from your tasks and your projects and your labs and shoots, and then you'll just have a whole uh, four or five or six, no, five or four, depending when you do it, weeks left just to revise the stuff we've already done. And so, that, so that's a, a thing. Now, if you take 1911 and you want to go on to do more computing, you know you have to go 1911, then you have to do 1921, and then you rejoin the mainstream. Everyone from this course, 1917, moves straight on to 1927 if they go on to do any more programming. If you do 1911, yeah, this, this course here sort of broken into, does that make sense? We split this course into two courses. So if you go and do that, you just get to do the first half. So you're welcome to transfer across to there. I have the same timetable as us, the same lectures and the same lab times. Uh, we try to make the lab times the same, certainly the same lectures. So you should be able to just transfer across on your timetable painlessly. Uh, their major projects just come out now too, and it looks really fun. Uh, so, so you're absolutely welcome to transfer across, because what we don't want you to do is now, we're just gonna be talking about ideas from now on, and we're just gonna take it for granted that you can program. So if you're having problems with the, I mean, everyone has some problems with the programming. I can't say if you have problems with programming um, transfer, because everyone has some, you know, everyone would leave if I said that. But if you're having serious problems, then you, the question you have to ask yourself is, am I prepared to practice and work hard and overcome these problems? Because it's just a matter of practice and you'll get it. It's not hard. Look, the, the biggest nong, who's the biggest nong in the audience here that can program? Yes, is it Danny? Alex. Alex, Alex Leon? How do you spell it? ONG, okay. Alex, are you a complete nong, a klutz, yeah. yet you can program? Yeah. Do you put it down to any particular property of your brain? No. What do you put it down to? I don't put it down to anything. Uh, you can't even think of a reason that's how klutzy you are? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Would you say that just because you've programmed a lot, it's helped you? Yeah, a lot of practice helps. A lot of practice, <laughs> thank you. Good man, must bar for you. So look, <laughs> if complete nongs like me and um, Alex can program, uh, there's hope for anyone here. But to program, you've just got to do practice. And hopefully you've been practicing every night and practicing every weekend and working hard. If you haven't, then you have to think now, oh, 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 I've got to do that practice and catch up on top of doing everything else. If you can, you're in, because we're not doing any more C syntax. <coughs> Taking it for granted, you know all that already. So it's just up to you to get on top of that over the rest of the course. Um, so do think about that and do ask your tutor. Now, if you found it hard because it had crazy and hard ideas, that's fine, because there were crazy hard ideas in it and also obscure ideas in it. But the first thing I want to say was well done, everyone. I was really pleased with everyone's effort. And really, it's the effort that gets there. It's the practice and doing that gets you the, the skills. Task two, why was it hard? It was hard because of ideas, not because of the programming. Third point, why was it hard was my second point. Third point is, 
Oh, yeah, the, the stress related to when they start. Oh, I said all the points already, but just in backwards order. Okay, cool. Any questions about task two? Yeah. Um, they mark the no, we don't mark read grid or show grid. Yeah. It doesn't work. No, that's fine. Oh, well, they might. Oh, I don't. Well, <laughs> if it doesn't work at all, you might be in trouble, but we don't apply unit tests to them. So someone will look at it. It'll be part of your style mark as to the overall thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that the same method? Shh, 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 shh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For every other tool, oh, there's only one task left. The project. Yeah, we're going to be testing in the same way, which is, shh, shh. when you write a file that does a chunk of work. At the same time, you're going to write a file called test file, test whatever the name of the file is, and in that is going to be one function called test everything or something like that, and that will fire off a series of small void functions, each one of which will be packed full of asserts. To check it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And normally in your main, you call the test guy first, then you'll call everything else. Yeah, that's how we're going to do it. Okay, so, cool. If there's no more questions about task two, I'd like to just do a big roadmap of what task two looked like. And we'll see, and then we'll superimpose that with what the project looks like, and you'll be able to see how they relate to each other. Now, task two. Yeah. Yes. Were they actually really thorough ones, or were they just stripped down to make sure it works? Oh, were my dry run unit tests thorough? Yes. No, they were just crappy little things, just to make sure there was nothing sort of obviously wrong. Okay. Yeah. So the, the the dry run, when you submit it, the dry run, they're not the marking tests. They're just some little tests. But, you know, in all likelihood, if you can pass those little tests, you'll pass all the big tests too. Yeah, yeah. It's just to make sure that you have the right named functions and you. You know, you make the right assumptions and things like that. Shh, 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 shh. Who think they, they, I see a lot of sad faces. Is everyone thinking they didn't do well in task two? Put up your hands if you think you didn't do well in task two. Oh, no. No, I've got to say, from everything I've looked at, everyone seems to be doing really well in task two. So maybe you're overly pessimistic, or maybe you have very high standards, which is good, which is good. But don't be sad, you should be happy with task two. Do you worry about task We don't have a task three. You're okay. Oh, no, we do have a project. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, don't worry about the project. The project's actually heaps of fun. But there's a bit of work to be done in the first week. Then after that, heaps of fun. Let me do a quick summary of the thing. We had, shh, 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 shh. We had a file called Sudoku Grid. Hey, no, I'm going to need everyone to be a little bit quiet now. We had a file called Sudoku Grid. Dot C. And we had a file called main. Now what happened was, the weird way we broke the assignment up, you might, the question I asked you at the end of last week was, why do we do it this hard, elaborate, difficult way, rather than just taking these two files and merging them together into one ginormous, but it wouldn't have actually been very big, one combined file that had all the functionality of solving the Sudoku problem, plus all the functionality of how to use a Sudoku grid. Why didn't we combine them? Why did we go to all that work? Oh, you've got the answer. Don't tell me the answer. But you actually sat down and thought about the answer. That's, you thought about the answer too. You guys, are, oh, no, tell me, because you did the homework. That's really cool. That was the homework. We'll start with Robert and we'll move, move back. Yeah. Um, two reasons. The yes. first reason would be Ah, okay. One, e, uh, let's put the big reason first, so I'll write that second. Ease of compilation, let me repeat that. Ease of compilation is, if it was all in one big file, and you change one little bit to do with the grid, then when you recompile it, you'd have to recompile that whole big file, whereas if we have it broken into lots of small files, C is actually clever enough not to need to recompile this one, if you only change that. How big a reason is that? Uh, how long does a compilation take you? Um, a couple of minutes if you've got something big. But in this case? A couple of seconds. couple of seconds or less than a second. Yeah, yeah. So we're saving less than a second once. 
OK, so, so but it is a reason. It is a reason, but it's not a big reason, which is come, yep. Yes. Encapsulation. I like that idea. What he said was, you could have one whole concept in this file, plus its associated header file, and you keep the concept separate. So the concept of this file is how to solve Sudoku. The concept of this file is how to deal with a Sudoku board. Now. If you later on had another project that used a Sudoku board but didn't need to solve a Sudoku, it did something else, worked out magic squares or something, you could reuse this bit of code that you've already written and tested. Yeah, you can see that? You can just take this and reuse it. So that's nice. It's also nice to have separate concepts in separate files just because it helps us think about them. It's also nice to have separate, well, I won't keep saying why because you two have got reasons. Yeah, start with, is, is, that is Danny, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, Danny, shoot. Well, if you have multiple files, you have multiple. Yes, thank you. Multiple, if you have multiple files, you can have multiple people working at the same time. That's a nice way of working on the project, rather than saying, I'm changing the file. No, I'm changing the file. No, I'm changing the file. You can each work on your own files. Yep, that's good. Alex. Uh, it makes it easier to mark. It makes it easier to mark. Well, look, that's the best reason. It makes it easier to mark. <laughs> I like that. Um, why does it make it easier to mark? Yes, yes. We also had, let me write down here, we had a unit tester program. It was quite nice, them all being in separate files, because then we could put our own Sudoku grid.c in and test your unit tester. And we could put our own unit tester in and test your own Sudoku grid. So it was easy to mix and match for us to mark. That made it very convenient. Yes, that's a good reason. There was another one there. Dane. It gets you used to working with standards, which was my actual, one of my main reasons for doing it. I wanted you to think about working with standards. What was the standard going on here? Someone from this side of the room, the neglected side. Yes. Sudoku, and why was Sudoku, that's correct. What, why was Sudoku grid.h a standard? Someone say it. Everyone used it. Everyone used it and what it, uh, that's correct. And what else about it made it like a standard? Perfect answer. I can't believe I keep forgetting your name. Carl. What's that? Carl. Carl. Carl uh, they're, they're all perfect answers. Sudoku grid dot h is this little file that lived here. And it is what we call a standard. It defined what the functions did, defined how the functions had to behave, but it didn't actually do any of it. So here's how it works as a standard. It defines all the different functions that Sudoku grid.c is providing to the world. And we hash include it in Sudoku grid.c, and that ensures Sudoku grid.c does actually define all those functions. And then we hash included it in main, and that ensured that main knew about all those functions. And any time main wanted to deal with a Sudoku grid, what did it have to do? Had to use one of those functions. So. Think of it like as a like a the, the interface is like a barrier between them. Like I said before, with the CDs and the CD player. One guy makes CDs that comply with the CD spec. Another guy makes CD, uh, CD players that assumes it's going to get CDs that apply with the, comply with the CD spec. The CD player can only call rely on properties that the CDs are guaranteed to have according to the spec, and any properties they're guaranteed to have according to the spec have to be actually implemented in the actual CD. This means you can plug any CD into any CD player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a perfect answer. Yeah. Now there was one more hand waving around the middle. Before was it you? Yeah, but he said it. Okay. All right. Well done. Okay. So the reason um, we broke it into parts, well, you've sort of encapsulated it nicely already. It was to get you used to the project because we're going to do it in the project. But that sort of begs the question: Why are we going to do it in the project? The reason we got you to break it into parts is if everyone looks after themselves. If Sudoku Grid just solves the Sudoku Grid problem, and the Sudoku Grid solver just works out how to solve Sudoku Grids, and the unit tester just looks after how to do unit testing, and everyone does their own little bit, then everyone can do, be really good and specialist in their little bits, and separate people can work on the problems, and yet when we combine it all together, it, all, it can work magically. All right, now, 
We call Sudoku grid.c, let's just call that the type, the Sudoku grid. Over here, main uses that type, Sudoku grid. So we're going to call main a user. Is there another user of Sudoku grid? The unit tester, yeah. So here's our environment. We've got two users that each want to use the same concept. If you coded it right, like someone said, we should be able to pull any one of these guys out and put an alternate in. Okay. Now, the reason I'm pausing for a sec is I'm trying to work out the order of what I want to say next. Because what we're trying to do here is a great and lofty and noble goal. And we didn't quite do it right in this assignment. There was a little weakness in the way we did it. And once we reveal that weakness and look at how to solve it, you will understand this concept here, which we call abstraction. You'll understand it perfectly. And that's what we're going to do in the project. So how are we going to reveal the weakness? Well, let me tell you the benefit I want to get. And then you can maybe see why we wouldn't necessarily always get this benefit. The benefit I want to get is that, uh, let's say, oh, what's your name? Oh, Richard. Richard. Yeah. Excellent name. Well done. OK. You can sit down, Richard. I just need a name. So Richard didn't get, I've, I've, um, actually, that's, that's a funny sort of attack in cryptography. That's like a reflection attack where you use the credentials of the person probing you against, yeah. So, I mean, you can, you can set that up in a funny way. Uh, in fact, there's a funny story about uh, the Russian MiGs, which remind me, and I'll tell you in the break if we have time, uh, where they do a similar sort of thing. Okay, so shh, 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 shh. the benefit we want to get is I've written in a lecture, say, how to solve Sudokus. It requires a Sudoku grid, which is required to have some functionality. So I, Richard Buckland, write a Sudoku grid dot C that provides that functionality. Then maybe me or maybe Thurston or, or my, oh, it's Adrian probably, uh, writes, a Adrian's in charge of task two. So he's doing most of the unit testing and the marking and he's doing a wonderful job. And he's going to write some unit testers that check that these functions are okay. And the unit testers are also just going to call these functions here. Okay. Now, oh, by the way, did the user use every single function in the interface? Did main use every function in the interface? There was one it didn't use. Which one didn't it use? Get cell. Never used get cell. Is the unit tester going to use get cell? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So get cell is still going to be used. Okay. Now here's, so that's our scenario. Now let me explain the benefit. The benefit's going to be that when you run my solver and my grid together on a particular Sudoku puzzle, we notice it takes three minutes to solve. And that's not acceptable. We're thinking, that's not fast enough. This is a computer. I want faster results than, did I say three minutes? I don't want to wait three minutes. I want the answer now. Richard arrives and says, oh, actually, Richard, so that's slightly confusing. Can we call you, what else should we call you instead of Richard? Glenn. <laughs> Someone else ask him what his name is. Someone with a different name to Richard ask him. What's your name? No, Alex. It's Alex, it's Alex asking you. Yeah. Do a reflection attack on it. Oh, Alex. Okay, well done. Cool. <laughs> okay. So Alex says, hey, I've written a Sudoku grid.c. I don't want to be rude about your one, Richard, but I think you might find mine's a bit better. And I say, <laughs> as if, and I pull mine out, put it carefully down to the side, and I take Alex's one and plug it in, and I run it on the problem, and it solves the problem in two seconds. <laughs> that is neat, OK? Now, this can only happen if we're all working on components that can plug and plug in out. And what it is that's just happened is we can decide to improve one part of it, and everything else still works. We can change this as much as we want to make it better, for whatever reason is better. And we're changing it in the utter confidence that we're not going to break anything over here. Now, how do we know that a change here is not going to break something here? Yeah, in longer words. 
the interface is standardized and your new code His new code complies with the interface. This works with anyone that complies with the interface. He simply has to check that his new code complies with the interface, with the header file. If your code complies with the interface, cha-ching, it will work and we'll pull mine out. Let me explain the underlying problem. In life, or in computing, when you write a small program, you've probably all written small programs now, it tends to work and if it doesn't work you can think about it and you can work out what the problems are and you can eventually solve them. And you'll find that as you write bigger and bigger problems, you start spending more and more time stuffing around trying to debug them. Because it's just little problems start appearing. And it turns out there's this really unpleasant effect that as the size of your program increases, as the size of the problem you're solving increases, Let's, complexity equals bugs. Yeah, and the more complex something is, the more bugs you're going to have. As the size of the problem increases, what happens to the complexity? It increases. Does it increase linearly? It turns out it doesn't. How nice it would be if it did. How does the complexity of a problem change as the size of the problem changes? Exponentially. Exponentially. Well, I'm going to say it's at least quadratically. Exponentially would be bad. Now, there's a famous law that says this. I can't remember which law it is. Does anyone remember? Someone, someone's law. No, it's not Murphy's law. Well, it could be Murphy's law. It is Murphy's law. It is. It's the law that the universe is out to get you and everything sucks. <laughs> so basically, as the problem gets bigger, you think, oh, I can write something to add up two numbers. And your mum says, okay, now write something to do my tax. And you think, okay, that's maybe 100 times harder to do her tax. It took me two minutes to add up two numbers. So it will take me 200 minutes to write a tax solving program. It won't. We just laugh at that concept. Because we know as the problem gets harder, the amount of time it takes to solve, the amount of complexity, the amount of bugs we're going to generate is going to increase at a much faster rate than linearly. The reason for that, if I could remember this law, I could just say this law and that could be the end of the lecture. There's a law. It's to do with the, the network effect. But I can't, I can't remember the name of the law. It's someone's law. Let's say it's Richard's law. <laughs> All right. Richard's law says, <laughs> as the size of the problem increases, the complexity increases as a square function. It says what that graph does. Let me show you why. You're writing your program to add up two numbers. Here's your program. And it's got like three lines of code in it. And you have to check, shh, 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 shh. You have to check for each one of those lines of code how it affects every other line of code. Like, they could interact in subtle ways, as you know. You might set a variable in one and use a variable in another. Or you might, you know, do something here that has a ripple effect here. So, if you have to think of all the interactions between three lines of code, how many, how many interactions are there? Three. There are three ways of choosing pairs of lines out of three objects. We, we write that as 3C2. Do you guys know that notation? Who doesn't know that notation? Okay. 3C2 it says, how many ways can you choose two objects? Uh, well, maybe I've written it backwards. Is it 2C3? No. 3C how many can ways can you pick two objects out of three? So if I said, I've got three children, I'm going to say, two of you can have a Mars bar and one can't. <laughs> how many ways can I make that ruthless decision? You can see there's three different ways I can do it, because there's three different kids that can be left out. In maths, that's called 3C2. There's a simple formula that gives it. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I don't, I don't want to go there into the formula. Uh, okay, now suppose. So, oh, but I can say that NC2, let me give a, a specific version of the formula. NC2 equals N times, you know this, I said it's the one piece of math you have to know. What's the one piece of math you have to know? N minus 1 divided by. Two. Remember, remember this is the one piece of math you had to know? Pops up all the time. We saw it as how Gauss added up all the numbers from 1 to 1,000. Okay. NC2 is this, which is approximately equal, well, is exactly equal to n squared minus n on 2, which is approximately equal to, if we're doing our approximations, well, who cares about a factor of 2? And which is going to be bigger, n squared or n? 
Much bigger? Yeah. yeah. So it's approximately n squared. <laughs> it's approximately n squared. Your error is going to be, you know, a little bit. So if I've got a program now to write my mum's tax program, sh 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 and it has 300 lines. And every line potentially can affect every other line in the program. When I change one line, how many lines potentially do I have to look at to make sure I'm not breaking something? 299 other ones. So if I was to draw all the interconnections, how many different interconnections are there? If every line can potentially affect every other line, how many connections, interferences could happen? It's um, a a 300 C2, which is approximately equal to 300 squared, which is approximately equal to it's a pro yeah, it's like approximately, uh, well, 300 gives me two zeros, and another 300 gives me two zeros, and multiplying two threes gives me 10. So it looks like about 100,000. Now it's going to be wrong by, maybe it's 50,000, maybe it's not 100,000. Who cares? It's about 100,000. That's a lot more things I have to think about than three. The program's 100 times bigger, but it's, you know, it's 30,000 times more complex. So. This is what kills us. In the old days when we used to write assembly code, and every line really could affect every other line, any line changing any register can affect any other line that uses that register, debugging them was a nightmare. So all of modern computing, largely, I'm going to make this outrageous claim, I'd say just about all developments in programming language have been to do with stopping things interfering with other things. So the number of interactions becomes manageable and we can visualize it. One way of doing that is to have a function. If you write a function, Every line in the function can affect every other line, but because of scope, what do we know? It can't affect outside the function. So if we break our program into functions, then inside every function they can interact, but we have limited interactions between functions, and the number drops down really quickly. So this is going to be our general brilliant way of solving complex problems. When we see a really complex problem that's really big, we are going to solve it by managing complexity. And we're going to manage the complexity by breaking the program into self-contained chunks that can't interact or that can only interact really mildly. Can you see that's how we did it here? We had a reasonably big program. We broke it into three chunks that only allowed to interact in these five or six ways that were in the interface. So the amount, if you change something in here, it cannot affect anything over here. The only thing it can affect is if I change the implementation of get cell, the only thing it can affect is function calls to get cell, which come out of here. And there'll only be two or three of those. Does that make sense? So it massively reduces the number of interactions. There have to still be some, otherwise there's no point in writing the whole thing if they don't interact with each other. But it massively reduces them. And this is how we deal with it. This is how your body deals with it. Your body is not like a jellyfish. A thousand cells, a million cells, however many cells, all the same, mush in a mush. Your body breaks things into individual jobs. It's got a heart that looks after the pumping bit. It's got a brain that looks after the thinking bit. And it's got uh, a nose, it looks after this, and you know, it divides us all into specialized bits, and that way we can achieve this extra complexity. Sure, in theory, you could just have every bit doing every, a bit of everything and everything being a big mess, and it maybe would still work. But it's much simpler if it's broken into discrete systems, each of which has precise behaviors it's supposed to exhibit, and, and precise responsibilities and roles in the body, and then collectively, collaboratively, all the systems work together to produce the overall effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah? That's how everything works. Um, What's another example? It's how a car works. If my car electrics breaks down, I go to an auto electrician. And he goes to a factory that specializes in making wire. There's not one bloke that does everything. It's a factory that makes wire. If there's something wrong with a radiator, I go to a radiator repair guy who knows all about radiators. And he looks after the radiator system in the car. I'm now close to the edge of my knowledge about cars. But <laughs> you see, if something breaks, it's not like an amorphous thing. It's, there's little specialist bits that all plug together in well-defined ways, and we just go and fix that little specialist bit. Okay, so our goal, our dream, what we hoped to achieve with task two, but I've already hinted we didn't quite pull it off, was we would like to have it so that this piece of code here could be changed at will, and this bit would still work, provided the meaning of all the functions, provided the extensional view of all the functions is kept right, we can change the intentional as much as we want. That was our dream. 
Now, why didn't we pull the dream off? Well, let me show you. Let's look at why our function might be slow. What, what, um, what were the, someone just quickly remind me, what are the functions in the interface of task two? There was get and set cell and clear. Oh, bugger. Clear cell is full. Get free is legal. Is that all? Read and show. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Look at these. Which of these potentially are going to give us the time hit? Now, before we answer that, you have to think there are two components to the speed contribution of each of these functions. One is how fast the function is, and the other one is how many times it's called. If there's a function that gets called a million times, and you can make it 10% faster, that might be very well more efficient than doubling the speed of a function that only gets called twice. Okay? Now, let's suppose we don't know the calling pattern, so they're all equally likely to be called. Just naively now, which ones seem to take the most time? Is legal is a slow one. Yeah, let's say that's on the, sl on the, on the complexity scale, we're going to give that a 10. Right, what else? Is full. Potentially, we'll have to search through all the squares on the board. So I'm going to give that like a 6. In fact, now I think about it, is legal much easier than that? Is legal harder to think about, but it's probably going to have to check 9 plus 9 plus 9, 27 things, isn't it? It does a, few, it does a bit more work for each of those 27 things. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not convinced that these aren't more closer. You know, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to put them both at 8 until further evidence arises. Get free. Get free. Yeah, yeah. How long can that take? But, it can take, potentially, in the worst case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it's, these are much less complex than this one. How often is legal, is legal called? They're probably all called roughly the same amount of times. I have to do an analysis of the code, of the algorithm, to see how often they're called. Um, now, is legal does get called maybe a few more times. Uh, I don't know. Is it? Definitely? Someone's saying it does? Yeah, so look, this is probably where we're most fruitful, but it's a long, messy function. I don't want to fool around with it on the board. So let's fool around with these two guys. I reckon they're going to give us good payback. Let's pick one of these two. Is full. Let's work with is full. Is full, given a board that's completely empty, will return an answer. I assume you did is full by looping through the board until you found an empty cell. And then when you found an empty cell, you either aborted on the spot or you kept looping, and at the end you terminated. Yep. I assume that's how you did it. So you either took 81 every time, or you took somewhere between 0 and 80, 1 and 81. On average, you took about 40. So you took 40 or 80 steps to do this. Ah, oh, that's too slow. How could we speed it up? Well, here's one way we could speed it up. How about we keep track over here of a counter that keeps track of how many empty cells we've got. And every time we clear a cell that was previously full, we increase the counter. And every time we write to a cell that was previously empty, we decrease the counter. What do you think of that? Then how long is, is full going to take? One, one thing. It's going to look at the counter and see is it 80, 81 or not? Oh, no, zero or not? Are there, depends if the counter's counting full or empty. I can't remember. What was I saying the full counter was counting? The counter counts empty. So we've got an empty counter. What's that? Don't you have to search through the cells at least once to find the set the original value? Oh, to set the original value of empty counter? Well, um, read, read board's going to have to do that for us. So here's uh, our read grid or read game or whatever it's called. When it reads it in, it's going to set this value initially. This value is going to be stored over here somehow secretly. No one's going to be able to see it. Every time we do a, um, a set or a clear, it's going to update the value. And whenever we want to work out if it's empty or not, we just have to consult this value. Now, whether that gives us a speed up or not depends on a lot of things. It might not work. I'm just giving you the general principle. Because now we have to do a little bit of work every time we do a set and a clear. So we're doing a little bit of work there. But it's saving us a bit of work every time we do an is full. In the balance of things, will that save us time or cost us time? I think done well, it will probably save us. But you'd have to do an analysis of how often they were all called compared to each other. But I reckon it's probably going to save us time. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
What about get free? Oh, no, let's not even do get free. We'll do get free in a sec. Let's look at this idea of how we could achieve this result then. You see, to achieve this result here, we would like our Sudoku grid type to store not just the value of all the cells. What else would we like it to store? A counter. Is that what you said over here? Yeah. So we'd like it to store a value, a, a, value, uh, a counter that tells you how many empty cells, and we'd like it to store all the cells as well. So we'd like it to store two things. How can we store two things in one type? Struct. Struct. All right. So here's how we could of, I don't know why we've just got this up here. Let me kill that. Let's change our definition of Sudoku grid. Let's call it something like this. Type def um, struct Sudoku grid, curly brackets. Uh, so this type, uh, so we're going to create a struct. Mm. Let me do it in two bits. There we are. Oh, how nice. You can't do this on a normal editor. <laughs> Delete to the left. <laughs> Create space on that side. So we've got struct Sudoku grid, and it's going to contain an array of values, which we go, what are we going to call that array of values? <coughs> the game. Now, this whole thing is sort of the game. The values are just part of the game. No, no, the puzzle is just a, a synonym for game. It, uh, what I'm saying is, what, what do we call the values of the grid? We could call it the contents. What if we call it contents? So we could say value contents. Uh, what was our hash define thing here? Grid size. Grid size. OK. And what else are we going to store? We're going to store an int, which is called, what do we call it? And the number of empties? Uh, uh, empty cells. Um, I'd like to have somehow indicate that it's a number of empty cells, not the empty cells themselves, because later on we'll be able to store the empty cells themselves. So what about... Now, look, the only abbreviation I, I really like is... I'm sick of typing number all the time, so I do sometimes say num. I don't mind if you abbreviate it that way, but now let's actually write the whole thing out. How about remaining cells? Uh, rema uh, 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 empty cell count. What do you think of that? Yes. Empty cell count. Empty cell count. All right, that's our struct. Now we want to, our code is, shh, shh. All our interface functions is expecting something called Sudoku grid. So we better create a Sudoku grid and we do that with a type def. How do we do that? Type def struct, whatever that was, Sudoku grid. Oh, it's confusing. Um, I, unfortunately, we do have this convention, we use the same word in both places. Let me use a different word today, just so you can see they don't have to be the same word. Let me call it, just, I'm picking a completely silly thing here, sausage P. <laughs> so it's type, <laughs> yeah, Viking sausage. It's EG, isn't it? Sausage P. And what are we going to call it? Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> yeah. Sausage P. Uh, so I'm giving it a completely silly name. In fact, yeah, let's put a J in there just to make it clear this is not anything we'd expect to ever happen. Normally, you'll pick the same name for both, but I want to put a ridiculous name in here so you can see which name corresponds with which. Type def struct sausage P is going to be called a Sudoku grid. Now, I've got to say, when we get it right, this is going to turn into a capital letter. Once we achieve our goal, once Sudoku grid is this beautiful type that you can change what you want at will and everything will still work, we're going to call it an abstract type. It's going to get five stars and we're going to give it a capital S for its name. At the moment, we still haven't quite achieved that. But we're getting better. So now Sudoku grid, all right, so if I put this, which file would I put this in? Where would I put it? Who needs to know what a Sudoku grid is? Everyone does. So it needs to go in the header file here. Does everyone agree? 
So if I put that code in the top of the header file here, instead of the old code that said something like what? What was it in the old days? It said type def value Sudoku grid grid size. Yeah, is that what it used to say? Yep. It used to say that. Now it's going to say all this stuff as well. If I whack that in the top here, now using Richard's clever thing of keeping a count of how many empty cells I've got, so he's sort of, it's a bit of, he's introduced a bit of redundancy in the information. He's cached that information so we don't have to recompute it every time, if you, if you like to think of it that way. Now everything's going to run faster. But we have a slight problem. It will run faster. It is diabolically clever, well done. But unfortunately, nothing's going to compile. Everything on this side's going to work just fine because we're going to rewrite all our functions to expect that they've got two parts of data now. They've got a counter and an array. But unfortunately, this side's going to grumble. Why is it going to grumble? Yes? It doesn't know which specific content you're talking about in the, in the struct. I went, uh, what do you mean? Oh, actually, no, I just no, no, yeah. yeah. Uh, remember, I haven't, we only did it at the end of last week. You, you guys might have forgotten. If I was to then say something like, let's show you how to use it, Sudoku grid grid, so grid is a Sudoku grid, then I can say things like grid dot contents five equals one. So this is how, in the old days I used to have to say, Yep, this is in the old days with the old where it's just an array. These days now it's two things, so I have to put this thing in here to say whether I'm talking about the array part or the counter part. Does that make sense? That's just how we use a, a struct. The problem we've got is that if I've changed the type, where was the type previously defined? It was previously defined in the standard. So the type was part of the standard. I've just changed the type. It means I've changed the standard. You can't change the standard and expect things still to work. Can you guys see that? You can't say, oh, I've got something and it complies with the standard because I changed the standard to make it fit. Because everyone that's already got stuff, now their stuff doesn't work because the standard's changed. How could Maine have relied upon the type? How could Maine have assumed the type was an array? Or actually, even more diabolical, who's more likely to have tripped up here? The unit tester, he's a legitimate user of this Sudoku grid. What might the unit tester have in it that looks, that's wrong now? The unit tester might have a line that looked like Sudoku grid, grid equals one, two, three, four, five. You might have an array initializer. That was completely legal. Because in the interface, we told you Sudoku grid was an array. So this guy might rely on it being an array. So now we've changed the type to be something else. It breaks this guy. And it can break this guy in all sorts of ways. Like maybe when you were testing set cell, did you do this? Did you say cell number 7 is 9, and then you peeped in the array to see if it was 9? Yeah. You've peeped in the array. You've relied on it being an array. If it's a struct now, it's going to go, what? You can't peep into the array because it's not an array, it's a struct. So anyone that did any test like that, and there was nothing wrong with doing that, but if you did any test that depended on it being an array, that test will now be broken if we stop it being an array. It's like saying, I've got a car and there's a place on the floor which used to be a footrest and now it's a sinkerator. And if you stick your foot in it, it'll get ground down. <laughs> now, if, if no one rested their foot on that part of the car before, if you were using the car interface, but you only used the steering wheel and the gears and the brakes, but you didn't use the footrest part of the interface, everything's fine and everything will still continue to work. But anyone that used to rely on that being a footrest now gets their foot ground down. Ow. Yeah, it's ow, it's cruel. I mean, you were bad to do that design. <laughs> so you can see. We can't change the type if people are going to be relying on it. Can, no, so I, hopefully I've set up this tension now. Can you see the tension? The tension is, on the one hand, we'd really like to be able to change the underlying type, 
if later on we can think of cleverer ways of doing it that are faster or better or something. We'd really like to be able to do that. And we'd like everything to still continue to work. That's what we'd like to do. But on the other hand, if the type is part of the interface and we change it, we're breaking the interface. And people are quite legitimate to be angry with us if they relied on it being the old type. How else might you have relied on it being the old type? Here are some more subtle ways. You might have done array lookups, sure. You might have done an array initializer, sure. What about just when in main, do you remember we started main by saying, here's the start of main. Oh, I haven't got enough blackboards. Here's what the start of main used to look like. It used to say Sudoku grid, grid. We assumed that would set up memory for a grid. That will set up memory for a grid if grid's an array, but later on we'll see it won't set up memory for grid if grid is some fancy types. So just by writing that, we've implicitly assumed that it was an array or something like an array. How else have we assumed it was an array? Well, we passed it into functions and we expected the functions to change its values. Is that legit? Can you pass a parameter in and expect a function to alter the contents of that parameter? That is legit if, if it's an array. That's how arrays work. What if it was a struct or something and you passed it in? It gets passed in by copy. Someone changes it, the function returns and it's the old value. You go set cell and it goes, oh, okay, I set the cell. And then the function terminates and you go, that's unchanged. Yeah, I changed it in the function, but that was a copy. The original Sudoku grid's never been changed. So you can implicitly assume it's array because arrays have certain properties. So can you see it's sort of like a mare's nest of potential nightmare. Once we tell someone it's an array, they can rely on it being an array in so many subtle ways that changing it, we, can't, we couldn't even contemplate changing it. It would just lead to widespread rebellion. Yet, it would be so wonderful if we could change it because Richard's idea is brilliant. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to have the break. After the break, we're going to give you the answer. But just so you've got the question, how can we set up a type, an abstract type, how can we create this type so later on we can change how the functions work and we can even change the underlying type. How can we do that so we can change that at will and not break all of this? And once we've worked out how to do that, we'll have created an abstract data type. A, D, T. Okay, guys, take a break. Whew. What's that? No, abstract. Abstract. Yeah.